Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be starting our unit uh, looking at uh, trust deformations, and this is going to be the first case, uh, the first uh, topic in the course, where we start really looking at statically indeterminate systems and applying the basic uh, components of structural analysis, such as constitutive relationships, equilibrium, and uh, compatibility, to solving certain, um, certain problems in statically indeterminate structures or statically indeterminate problems. So in this, uh, in this particular lecture, we'll just be uh, building up really from basic physics, uh, starting with basic physics and basic mechanics, building up a toolkit of parts that we'll then use as we develop our equations for trust analysis and that we'll then use in uh, later portions of this uh, and other courses. Uh, what we have looked at so far in the course is we have looked at uh, primarily statically determinate structures. So we've looked at a variety of things. So let's think about some things we've considered. Uh, things we've considered so far in the course. Well, we've done a lot of different things. We've looked at, uh, for example, we've looked at beams, their shear and bending moment. Oh, uh, we've looked at trusses, solving for all their various internal forces. And we have also looked at cables and arches. However, these three things, uh, these three topics, and some others we've looked at as well, all have the same, um, all have one thing in common. Well, they have several things in common, but one of the primary things they have in common is that we have so far limited ourselves primarily to statically determinate systems. And uh, as we review, if, you're, if you want to, let's review a bit uh, what statically determinate means. Uh, statically determinate refers to, uh, again, where whether your equations of equilibrium or your number of unknowns matches your equations of equilibrium. So each, uh, so for example, again, uh, each, we have each unknown. And that unknown could be a force, moment, reaction, etc. But each one uh, requires a equation of equilibrium. If we want to solve it using statics alone, you know, and, and of course by equilibrium, I'm referring to our summation of forces in the x direction, summation of forces in the y direction, summation of moments, etc. And so for a simple, for a single rigid body, that means we can solve for up to three unknowns. And for more complex bodies, such as trusses, well, the number of unknowns we can solve for will vary based on truss geometry. However, there are some problems, and actually most real world systems, are sufficiently complex that uh, statics is, is uh, no longer sufficient uh, to actually uh, solve things the way we need to. For example, um, if I were to... Let's look at some examples of statically indeterminate systems. So what kind of stat what are some examples of statically indeterminate systems? Well, think for a moment about a building frame. A building frame um, one not built as a truss, but one built as, say, a, a moment frame where all of the joints are rigidly connected. This is a very common method of construction, a very common in high seismic regions especially, and as, you know, Portland obviously is. And so um, here we have a, a case where this is a very common type of structural frame, but we cannot, we cannot solve for all of our internal forces uh, internal moments, internal shears, etc., using statics alone. Um, if you think about the number of unknowns on this, well, looking just at this as a single rigid body, but if we look at just the reactions, not even looking at the internal forces, if we look at just the reactions, there would be 
uh, a force in the X and the force in the Y here. So I could say AX, AY, and maybe an MA, and a BX, a BY, and maybe an MB. So just on the just on in terms of the uh, entire frame as a rigid body, uh, just looking at the reactions, I have six unknowns here, and because it is just one single rigid body, I will have uh, again I have three un uh, three uh, equations of equilibrium. I have three equations, but six unknowns. And if I try dividing this up, if I try, uh, let's say, what if I just cut this with another of sections and I isolate this piece? Well, that actually doesn't help me at all if I don't have any kind of like moment release or anything like that in there. Because if I cut that piece out, now look what I've done. I have, uh, yes, by, by isolating this, this piece here, um, just the right side of the frame, I have given myself more equations of equilibrium However, I have in turn revealed even more unknown forces in the frame that we would need to consider. So that doesn't really help us much. Um, so what we really need is we need, th this is really the limits of statics. Um, in this course, we have looked at lots of, we have looked at many different statically determined systems. We have looked at finding the shear and bending moment diagrams of beams and their functions. We've looked at trusses, uh, finding their compressive and tensile forces. And we've uh, then looked at cables, cables, arches, funicular arches, etc. But now we have really reached the limits of our um, approach of looking at just static uh, statics alone. And so what we really need to do is we need to find uh, other ways of solving for unknowns. So we have fed, uh, essentially our problem at this point is that we have way too many unknowns and not enough equations. And we can't just keep going to equations of equilibrium because there, for example, on a 2D rigid body, there are only three equations of equilibrium. And no matter how many times you cut a single rigid body into its component pieces, uh, if there aren't any kind of moment releases or pin joints or anything like that internal, Cutting a, uh, a member or a, or a frame into smaller pieces, yes, it gives you more equations of equilibrium. You could take equilibrium about this piece and about this piece, but you always end up revealing just as many new forces as equations of equilibrium that you gain. So unfortunately, we cannot rely on statics alone for everything. So we need to start thinking about other ways of solving for unknown forces. We need new equations. We need new uh, methods. We need new ideas. And so uh, let's begin and let's consider some things that we might do. So we need, again, we need new ways or new tools to solve for uh, member forces. And this, is, this isn't even getting into deformations. We haven't considered deformations really uh, much at all yet. And here I'm going to present really a, a sort of a high-level overview of the three main ways as structural engineers we have of uh, providing more equations, uh, more equations to solve for unknowns. And the, the number of potential equations we can gain is really limitless. There are there are uh, there are many different tools we can use. There are many different approaches we can take. And uh, it really just depends on the kind of system you're dealing with, uh, what kind of assumptions you want to make, etc. So, for example, um, well, let me just go into the, uh, fundamentally, there are three uh, tools of uh, structural analysis. And these are sort of broad categories of sources of new equations. Or you might think of these as sources of equations. E equations that we can then use to solve for unknown forces, unknown reactions, etc. 
the first three, the, and, and again, these are uh, the three main categories. Uh, the first is equilibrium. You've already seen this. This is your statics. Um, this can be static, but you can also have internal equilibrium. For example, if you have, uh, when you're studying reinforced concrete, you can have, uh, you know, a concrete beam where there is a seal reinforcement and the uh, you'll have compression, a compression region in your uh, concrete and tensile forces in your steel. And the compression forces must balance the tensile forces in the steel. But uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. We'll be getting into reinforced concrete next term. Um, so you can have statics, you can have uh, material equilibrium, etc. Um, another piece of information is uh, com compatibility. Think about compatibility now. Um, if I have, imagine I have a frame, a simple frame like this. Let's say the frame is a uh, cantilever beam but then has a cord coming down that is connected to the wall. This system, as it is now, is statically indeterminate. Um, there are, if you think about the uh, number of, uh, if you think about the number of forces on this, I would have an X force, a Y force, an X, a Y, and a moment. So this, as a whole, is statically indeterminate. Now, it's not going to be as bad as you'd think because we do have our, because um, we do have our basically a moment release at the end of the cables. But uh, still, this is a statically indeterminate system, at least at treating it as a single rigid body. But um, don't get too hung up on this one example. But what I'm trying to show is that um, imagine what happens if I deflect this beam downward. Imagine if I come along and apply a large load to this beam, like so. Well, if I apply this uh, a load to this beam, it's of course going to deflect downward like this. Greatly exaggerated here. Maybe some sort of delta y, some sort of change in height. Now, what's interesting is that uh, when I say compatibility, what I'm really saying is that the uh, relation between is that the uh, is spatial relationships between different materials and members. So, for example. This element here, if uh, if this end bends, if the end, if this beam is going to drop down delta y, well, this cable is going to have to do the same thing. The cable is also going to drop down delta y, and so uh, that may not seem like much, but that is actually something you can use as a source of another equation. Um, simply because there are certain force displacement relationships within the beam, certain force displacement relationships within the cable, and you can set them equal to each other in terms of that vertical displacement because these two points will move together. And so that is an example of compatibility. Another example of compatibility um, would be something like, uh, if you want to think more about reinforced concrete, uh, you know that uh, we assume when we're designing a reinforced concrete beam again, with something like some rebar in the bottom here, uh, we assume a constant strain profile versus depth. So in other words, we assume that at this point, the strain in the steel is equal to the strain in the concrete. This is an example of compatibility. We assume that the deformations are constant at one, uh, at one spatial location, and that helps us provide another equation that we can uh, build upon uh, that we can use in addition to our equations of equilibrium. And then finally, we have things like constitutive relationships. And uh, this has a couple definitions, but where I, what, I primarily th what I primarily think of when I think of constitutive relationships are things like material properties. And these can be, sing depending on the type of analysis you're doing, this can be a single, uh, a single value. For example, 
if I know that, uh, for example, steel, I know the modulus of elasticity of steel is 29,000 KSI. Well, what does that mean? Well, E is uh, E in terms of elastic modulus, of course, is defined as stress over strain. And so I know how, so uh, E essentially forms a relationship between stress, which is a force, and strain, which is your displacement. So you essentially have, a rela e essentially is the relationship between stress and strain. If you have your strain on the x-axis and the stress on the y-axis, um, your E is like this. And this can go even further if you have a material that you might say, uh, you might analyze something as with an elastic plastic assumption. And instead of just treating it as a single uh, slope, you might have something like this, where you assume it remains linear up to the, uh, up to the yield uh, stress and the yield, uh, yeah, up to the yield stress, I have to say sigma y, and then it just goes horizontal after that. This is, a, this is another example of a constitutive relationship that you might assume, the elastoplastic assumption. But anyway, that's a bit outside where I want to get right now. But these are all examples of constitutive relationships. These are examples of um, we're making certain material assumptions, certain assumptions about the material that our structures are actually made from. And we are then in turn using these to get some relationship between forces and displacements that can then serve as another equation um, to help us go beyond what we can achieve with statics alone. So um, I'm going to discuss today uh, an, the first sort of uh, first sort of category of these type of tools that we're looking at, and these are based on a combination of compatibility and constitutive relationships, and that is energy methods. So today I want to introduce energy methods, specifically as it applies to trusses. So any questions so far? I know this is kind of high level stuff, but I just I wanted to sort of place us in, where we are in the context of the overall course. Any questions? Okay. So we're going to look at energy methods first, and the reason we're going to look at those first is because they have a particular property in that they have, uh, if you think back to basic physics, energy methods have a property known as path independence, which we'll consider. And that property turns out to be useful for, turns out to be very useful for uh, various aspects of uh, structural analysis, as we'll see. All right, so energy methods. What do we mean by energy methods? Well, energy methods, we, I could define this another a number of ways, but essentially it's what's on the tin. Energy methods involve uh, applying tools of conservation of energy to and, and a balance of work and, and, and internal energy to the solving of uh, displacements, rotations, etc., in statically determinate or indeterminate systems. So let's think back to basic physics, and I'm not, I'm not even going to go into like uh, uh, university physics. I want to go way back to like the simplest form of physics. Let's go to high school physics. So let's go to high school level physics um, and think about some kinds. Let's think about energy very, very abstractly. So types of energy. And this is sort of elementary physics definitions of energy. Well, we have a couple. Uh, we have, for example, gravitational potential. Again, if you have if you have a mass, some mass m, and you raise it up a certain value h, you know, and here it's at h1, here it's at h2, with then a delta h between them, 
And then the potential energy gained, potential energy gravitational, is just mg uh, delta h. No great surprise there. Also, of course, we have kinetic energy. Um, we have uh, kinetic, so this would be gravitational potential. And we also have kinetic. Now, this isn't going to be too relevant unless you're dealing with dynamics, uh, which is important for seismic design, but that's a bit beyond the scope of this course. So, of course, if you have a mass that is moving along with some velocity, you know that its kinetic energy is simply equal to one-half mv squared. No great surprise there. However, there is, uh, so this one isn't going to be too important for our class. Uh, again, unless you're dealing with dynamics, uh, we don't really, we assume our loads are applied slow enough or are applied gradually enough that you don't have to worry about uh, dynamic effects like that, unless you're dealing with seismic th things like seismic forces and such. Uh, potential energy gravitational, we also don't deal with the, that one that much because the displacements our structures undergo tend to be so small that the change in gravitational potential energy is negligible. So why am I going back to basic physics? Well, there is one type of energy that is very useful um, in the context of structural analysis, and that is the humble spring. Actually, let me not, I don't want to draw this as a mass. I don't want to draw a spring on a mass on a spring. I just want to draw a spring. So let's say you have a spring And it has a spring constant K and some force F. And uh, we remember by Hooke's law that F is simply equal to KX. Technically, it's negative KX, but I'm just looking at magnitudes right now, so that's not a big deal. And then if you recall, the potential energy stored in a spring is one half KX squared. No great surprise there. The potential energy in a spring is one half KX squared. So that's all fine and dandy, but where does this come from? Where does this uh, potential energy for a spring come from? That again is the energy stored in a spring. So where does this come from? Well, let's take a look. So uh, we can recall from basic physics that uh, the amount of work done on something is equal to the integral of f, f of x, dx. And if I have, a, if I plot my spring force versus x, f, or x and f, I would of course get a linear line, just a straight linear line with a slope of k. And the, again, this represents that as I increase the deformation, the force in the spring becomes larger. So if I want to find the amount of work done by a, linearly vary, by a linearly varying force, I simply take the area under that curve, one half base times height, and that uh, work, which in this case is stored as spring potential energy, is simply equal to one half uh, kx squared, or one half, um, at this point, at the peak, f equals kx, and we have a length of x here, so one half base times height, we just have one half x times kx or one half kx squared. And we could get the same thing just by directly integrating our f equals kx relationship. So no great surprise there. So what this effectively represents is this represents energy stored within a material. Um, now, we use this model as, we, we describe things as a spring in basic physics, but in reality, uh, we use springs, we can use springs as models and as analogies for things much more than just, uh, you know, your actual literal, literal coil of wire. So the same type of relationship applies to many different contexts, many different materials, including things that we like to design with, like beams, columns, uh, truss members, etc. So, but I do need to review, before we go on to that, we do need to review a few other basic physics principles that we need to use. So, this is the uh, potential energy stored in a spring by a linearly varying force. Uh, 
And where is that energy actually stored? Where does that energy actually come from? Or where, what am I actually doing to store energy in a spring or in any other material? Well, to see where that energy is actually stored, we would need to zoom way in to the uh, atomic or molecular level. And imagine um, a material that is just now, I'll just draw it as a, sink, as a simple set of, uh, a simple set of uh, cubic grids here. But imagine I go and uh, pull on this. Imagine I go and I apply a large force to this whole thing. Well, what determines the lengths? Of, okay, think about this for a second. In a material that doesn't have any force on it, what determines how long the individual uh, molecular bonds are? Well, those bonds are essentially a balancing act between um, molecular repulsion and attraction, and that, that comes out of general chemistry, material theory, etc. And, uh, and, and also a balance between the attractive forces and the kinetic energy of the uh, individual atoms or molecules. So that's why if you increase the kinetic energy of, of material, or if you, in other words, if you heat it up, the bonds will want to pull, the, the strength of bonds pulling everything together remains the same, but the kinetic energy of resisting those bonds increases. And that fundamentally is why when you heat a material, it undergoes thermal expansion. The bond length between atoms is a balancing act between the kinetic energy of the molecules and the attractive forces in the bonds, and also electron repulsion and some other things. But the key here is that when I apply an external force, I disturb that equilibrium, and now all of these bonds will want to lengthen a bit. Something kind of like this. All of these bonds get stretched out, and then because of that, um, that they still want to return to that equilibrium state. And so again, when I stretch a, a set of atomic bonds out, there is one length for a given temperature that those bonds would like to be at, but when I stretch them, when I apply a force to them, or even if I compress them, the opposite, if I stretch them, I'm stretching out those atomic bonds and they are being dragged out, kicking and screaming out of equilibrium. And then um, the moment I release that force, they will want to bounce back to their previous state. And as they're flying backwards, that of course would uh, result in them accelerating and generating kinetic energy, which ultimately would end up as heat, etc. cetera. So uh, fundamentally, when we apply strain to an element or a member, we are storing that energy. We are storing that energy internally, and we are storing that energy, if you really want to get down to it, in the form of lengthened molecular and atomic bonds between atoms and molecules. That fundamentally is what spring uh, potential energy is, or uh, more generally, beyond spring potential energy, uh, we have a term which is elastic potential energy. And that, this is going to be very useful for us. Elastic potential energy. Okay, so we have that. Uh, we know where energy is stored. We've reviewed that. Uh, we, we've reviewed where energy is stored internally when applying a, a force or a stress to an element. So we've reviewed that. Now, um, let's look at what happens with different variations in force. Any questions so far? Okay. So we've seen how energy is stored internally in elements. Uh, now we just need to 
look a bit more about some relationships between uh, work, force, distance, and also internal work or internal uh, energy storage. So, now, first of all, I want to say something about uh, constant force versus linearly varying force. So, again, first we saw the linearly varying force, your classic spring potential energy, where we have your K, and then the area under this curve, again, is your uh, spring potential energy, and that, or your elastic potential energy, and that is one half k x squared, k x squared, del k delta x squared, etc. Um, but what about what if we were to take this graph and zoom in on it? What if we were to zoom in really, 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 really close? What would we see? If I zoom in on a really tiny portion of this. Well, what I would see is, sure, if I plot it uh, with the right axis, I could have, I, I could end up with the right, if I, I could end up with the same slope. But really, as you really zoom in on things, um, what you would see is that uh, you might have something kind of like this. If you zoom in on one point, maybe here, the force down here, the force maybe is like, I don't know, 10.00 newtons. Maybe up here, the force is 10.001 newtons or something. So if you zoom in on this diagram, you'll see that, yes, the forces continue to vary, but they're not that different. If you zoom in very closely, uh, you'll see that the, the force uh, between two points on the curve isn't varying very much. So, um, and we would refer to this as a small displacement. So if your displacements are small, as you, as you zoom in on a uh, force diagram here, a force, uh, a force displacement diagram here, as you zoom in um, and make your change in x very small, your change in f also becomes very small. So if you have very, very, very small uh, changes in, in, um, in position, in deformation, etc., then your force becomes constant, or your force is approximately constant. So if your uh, delta x is small, and this is for the same material, even if it actually does have this one half kx square behavior, but if delta x is small, f is approximately constant. And this is very useful to structural engineers because there is, uh, in most real world structures, the, the deformations you get com uh, to generate um, in most real world structures, the amount of deformation you need to uh, have the structure completely exceed any of its design loads are still very, very small. I mean, structures do have flexibility, but they're not actually springs. We can use the equations of springs. <laughs> we can use the equations of springs and elastic potential energy to investigate them. But at the end of the day, a structure is not a giant coil of, uh, of springing wire. So. If F is constant, this changes our force displacement diagram. Instead of being linear, if F can be regarded as constant, what then happens is that our force diagram becomes uh, constant. And so we have a delta X, we have an F, and the work done, or the potential energy stored within, is just f delta x. So if f is very, if, if our change in displacement is very small, if our displacement is very small, our change, in, our change in position or our deformations are very small, then our f is approximately constant. And we'll be able to use this as we uh, work through a few things. So moving on. Okay, some other things from basic physics.
Um, I'm basically, what I'm doing in this lecture essentially is going back to basic physics and grabbing a series of tools and concepts that we will build up as we uh, start to work through uh, uh, energy methods applied to uh, trusses. So another thing that we need to consider from physics is the relationship between force, displacement, and work. Force, display, and force. Okay. So you may remember the equation, work equals force times distance. Now, this is not really a complete equation. A more proper form would be something like work equals F net times, not F net, uh, not times, but dotted in to a displacement vector, something like that. Or if you want to consider a simplified scenario, Imagine you have a, let's go back to a basic physics scenario. Let's say you have a, a block being dragged along the ground. So you have a block, it's being dragged along the ground with some force, and that force though is not, uh, is not parallel to the path of displacement. It's not, the ground is level, the block is moving level, uh, is moving horizontally, the ground is horizontal, but the force is applied at a, uh, an angle above the horizontal and your delta x would be something like this. You're changing position, or maybe I'll, yeah, that, that's fine. So the actual work done by this force, the, the component of this force, okay, so this force has components Fy and Fx, but since this block is moving horizontally, only the component of the force that is aligned with the direction of motion will actually do any work. So the work done by this force is then uh, F, uh, Fx times the displacement delta x, or F cosine theta delta x. So we can see then that uh, if we have a force that is undergoing, uh, that is moving through a certain displacement, uh, if we want to find the work done by that force, we need to take the component of that force that is in a given um, direction or is in the direction of motion. So again, I'm, this is kind of just a, I'm sort of just building up our toolkit as we move along and slowly build up our, um, our relationships uh, that we'll use to analyze the displacement of trusses using energy methods. So next I wanna consider uh, one final uh, thing from basic physics, and that is one of the most valuable properties of energy methods. And this is especially useful for uh, structural analysis. So let's consider, uh, let's consider again energy methods. And one of their most useful, perhaps their very most useful property and that is the property of path independence. Now a famous, or I don't know famous, or at least one of my favorite uh, demonstrations of path independence, their independence in terms of basic physics, is the roller coaster problem. So let's say you have a roller coaster, and it goes through a series of loops and loop-de-loops and all sorts of fun things. And uh, let's say I have a cart that I released, uh, and let's call this position one, this position two. Let's say I, I release it from let, uh, rest, so V1 is zero. And let's say I know the heights at point one and point two. So I have H1 and from the same uh, datum line, I have H2. Well, uh, one special thing about uh, energy methods is um, if we can neglect any kind of frictional losses, if, is, if this is a, fric a frictional system, if there are no uh, non-conservative forces, uh, only the final and initial state matter. If uh, no losses, 
All you need to know is the initial and final state. Only the initial and final state need be considered. So what do I mean by this? Well, imagine I were to try to do this uh, using force methods. If I try to model the behavior of a, uh, a roller coaster car as it actually works its way through this track, I'm going to have to keep track of all the force, dis all the force vectors, uh, continuously keep track of all the forces that are being applied to it, any frictional force that's applied, any centripetal force that is present, any kind of normal force, and the changing angles, and all sorts of fun, crazy stuff. But, uh, and that's going to be a nightmare, so I would need to know a lot more, and to do, to do this using force methods, I would need to know a hell of a lot more about this roller coaster. I would need to know the exact track geometry, I would need to know things like the, you know, frictional coefficients between the tires of the, of the car and the track, et cetera, et cetera. This would take, uh, we're going to need a few weeks to solve this problem. But um, with, uh, with a simple energy method, all I have to do is say that Ke1 plus Pe1 equals Ke2 plus Pe2. In other words, the mechanical energy is conserved. I can go directly from the final state to the initial state and uh, I don't have to worry about all this mess in between, which is very useful. And uh, also, another great quality of energy methods is that energy can simply be summed. It can simply be summed uh, numerically. And that is incredibly useful. So um, there is no directionality to, sh to energy. It doesn't have a direction to it. Unlike force, which, you know, force, of course, has a vector. It has a, it is a vector quantity. It has both a magnitude and a direction. Energy, however, is a scalar quantity. It can simply be summed. And that is incredibly powerful. So if you're, uh, and if we want to see what this might be, think about this for a moment. In case you can't see where this is going, let me illustrate this. So, consider this for a moment. Imagine I have a simple truss, and I wanted to find, um, say, how much it was going to deflect. Say I have a truss like this, simply supported, and I apply a load at mid-span, some load P. Now, uh, let's say I want to know not just the f previously what we've done with trusses is we have found the internal forces, both uh, shear or not shear, but but uh, both tension and compression. But let's say I wanted to go beyond that and actually predict how far this truss would uh, deform downward. Well, this truss is going to undergo some uh, deformation. I don't know what that deformation is, but it is going to be some value. And in turn, all of the members of that truss are going to move. Everything will deform together. Um, because it's not going to be such a large deformation that the truss will fracture and just, you know, rip a chunk out of it or something. Hopefully that won't happen. But um, it's a relatively, and even this is greatly exaggerated. But the key is that um, while this moves, while this P moves downward, think about what's happening to the members. Uh, think about this horizontal member here. When I go and uh, rotate, if, when I go and deform this thing downward, well, this member must be undergoing some change in length. Um, the, if you just think about it from a triangular point of view, a Pythagorean point of view, initially it was this length, the horizontal length, and now it's going to be uh, it's going to be in the uh, it's going to be on the hypotenuse of this triangle, 
so its length will increase. That is going to take energy. That is inevitable. Uh, this, if it's a material, if it's made of actual matter, out of actual material with actual stiffness, um, if I want to uh, make this thing deform, if I want to make this thing deflect, I have to apply not only force, but I have to apply energy. And so as I pull downward on this truss, um, yes, my force P will undergo, well, two things will happen. First, my force P will undergo some deformation, like a delta P, or sorry, a delta Y or something. And so from that, it will do a certain amount of work. But then that work will be balanced by the internal energy stored in the truss. The truss is basically acting as a giant spring. And so I can find the, um, so based on uh, the forces applied to each member, they'll either expand or contract, and either of those requires energy. Compressing a spring or expanding a spring, or stretching a spring, I should say, both require energy. So if only I could somehow sum these up, and, oh, and, and this is also the great thing. If I have, uh, if I know, uh, if I have the force P here, the great thing about this is that I can simply sum up the energy required to deform each of these. So in other words, P times some delta Y, for example, that would be the, maybe the external work. And this has to be equal to the summation of all of the energy stored in all the members. Again, the external work, the symbol for uh, P times delta Y, um, that has to be equal to the four, all of the energy stored in each of the individual, in, in uh, all of the energy stored in each of the individual members. And again, the great thing about energy methods is that they are path independent. Energy is a scalar quantity, not a vector. So I can simply sum up the total energy required uh, to deform each member and relate that directly to the amount of work, uh, the amount of external work that my force P will do. This is incredibly powerful. So. Um, although uh, maybe certain definitions of power are slightly different. So, uh, so we've seen the basic principle here. This is the basic principle of energy methods uh, as applied to trusses. We need to find a way of relating our force P to, a, uh, to the internal energy stored in um, a member, in a truss member. So to do that, um, further on, we need to go back to not basic physics, but basic mechanics. To take a look at that, to analyze this properly, we need to look not at basic uh, physics, but at mechanics. So um, we've considered just the uh, very elementary definition of elastic potential energy. That's just treating things as a spring constant. But really, we need to go a little deeper and uh, get something that we can actually uh, work with. So uh, we need to that next look at uh, strain elastic potential energy, or simply strain energy. And the strain energy, again, is the... Uh, well, strain energy, you could define it as the amount of energy stored in a member undergoing deformation. And right now, we're not going to consider moments. I'm going to look at just um, simple axial deformation. So let's say we have an element. And this is going, I'm going to treat this as a truss element where we have just a single axial force. So let's say we have a, uh, an element here. And it has length L0 an initial length, and I apply a force to it, F. And let's also say that this has properties, uh, some area A, 
and it's made of some material with a modulus of elasticity E. Um, and I'll say it's just, we'll treat this as it's, that it's say pinned on this end so it can't move in this end. Um, so it'll be, it'll be pinned on this end, so it will simply deform against its support here. Well, this uh, element, of course, is going to stretch a certain amount. And I'm going to call that delta L. So we have an initial L and then a change in length. Simple enough. Okay, so simple enough. Now let's look at if we can, if we can somehow uh, turn this into an energy relationship. So we have a basic description of the setup. And then um, let's think about the stress in the member. And that, of course, is that sigma is equal to F over A, using sigma for normal stress and using F and A, simple definitions. Um, then we can define strain. Strain can be defined as, or is defined as, strain is simply equal, at least engineering strain, is equal to delta L over L naught, is the change in length over the initial length. Uh, no great surprise there. And then uh, we can apply stress-strain relations. As we saw earlier, um, stress and strain are united by the modulus of elasticity. So again, we know that uh, our, that epsilon, our strain, is equal to sigma over E, over our elastic modulus. Or I could set this up as sigma, not, S, uh, not sigma, epsilon. Epsilon E is equal to sigma. No great surprise. Now I can substitute my sigma for my sigma and my epsilon for my epsilon. And I suddenly have, uh, let's see, if I do that, um, I will have for my epsilon, I'm going to substitute delta L over L naught times E and then sigma F over A. And if I do a little algebra, I can find a classic mechanics equation, which is delta L equals F L over AE. And notice, um, this ends up resembling very sim becoming very similar to a spring constant. If you think about the definition of a spring constant from mechanics, uh, we have F equals uh, K delta X. Well, it's very similar to delta L, isn't it? So this is all, if, if I were to rewrite this, this would all, I could rewrite this as F uh, equals delta L times AE over L. And in that case, this AE over L would be very similar to a spring constant, although that's uh, a little bit uh, superfluous for this. So we now have our basic, uh, from mechanics, we now have a basic relationship between um, change in length and the force in the member. And in the next lecture, we'll be continuing on uh, building up to our, uh, our actual trust deformation relationships. All right, any questions on this? All right, if there are no questions, I think I'll go ahead and let you go. Um, again, I was just, today we're kind of starting at the very basics, building up from uh, elementary physics and building up to some of the tools that we will use in uh, trust deformation analysis. And thank you. All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, Again, in this lecture, we focused on just building up some of our basic components that we'll then use in uh, later videos and later lectures to uh, develop more of our uh, tools of truss deformation and uh, design. So again, um, in terms of takeaways from this lecture, we built up from basic physics looking at, kinetic, uh, looking at uh, elastic potential energy and the benefits of energy methods, and we finished and we built it, built it up uh, into basic mechanics uh, concluding uh, right at the point where we were calculating or deriving the formula for uh, the basic mechanics formula for the uh, force deformation relationship of a truss member. And we'll be using that relationship and others as we continue in part two of this uh, 
particular portion of the course. So I hope you all found this a little bit enjoyable or useful. Uh, be sure to look at the follow-up video when it's available. Uh, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe to, like, to make the robots happy. And uh, again, I hope you found this a little bit useful or maybe a bit informative. Regardless, look forward to seeing you all again in the next lecture. I look forward to seeing you all then. And as always, thank you.